like they're improving. Uh, that's what's going to bring them back to practice day in, day out. That's on the team's uh, agenda. Um, and so as, as we do that, we're going to watch a video uh, by Carol Dweck, who's done some really cutting edge research. You've, uh, how many of you have read her book, uh, Mindset? It's, it's cutting across business and education and, and here with coaching uh, uh, by storm. So then we talk about, uh, talks about, let me just jump ahead there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so one of the things that Carol Dweck talk, spoke of was the need for, for athletes to believe that they can get better. Now, I, we're sports people. We're, we're hockey people and soccer people. We aren't hypnotists. So if we have athletes, how do you think you could get your athletes to believe that they can get better? What's a, something you could do between now and next week that would impact the way your athletes believe they can get better, do you think? Um, I think I would probably show them how they've gotten better. You know, some kind of little statistic about, you know, that I remember from last week, I would just, I would show them, you know, or mention to them how much they've improved in that certain area, whether it was like shooting or dribbling the ball or whatever it was. I think I would bring that up to them. Absolutely. If we, if we can connect success to what their effort has been working towards, we, we've already begun to show them that it's possible. They, they part of our job as a coach is to help bring them to that point. Um, anything else that you can think of? Something you might do with, with uh, players as you go? I would think I would just cheer them on. I mean, I think just the fact that they would have our support would make them feel like they're improving and they're getting better. So just being, being a support network for them. Absolutely. So, so we were at this workshop and Carol Dweck has told us that, that if, uh, if kids understand that their coaches value effort, then those kids are going to perform better. So as coaches, that's what we're going to do. And the best way to do that is exactly what you said, Kelly, is we're going to become a noticer of effort. If, it's, if we say that it's important at our preseason meeting, then we want to make sure that we're nurturing that idea by actually noticing it. Put some energy, put some attention towards those things that, that we say are important. Um, and effort being such a key part of that. Um, finally, probably the best way to point out to kids that you value effort is to flat out tell them that. Make mm -hmm. sure that it's not something by they make those connections. But what we can really talk about the culture of our team that, that what we're going to value as a group, the coaches, the players, in each other, in ourselves, is the idea that the very first thing that we can control is our effort, regardless of where we, where we come uh, in our abilities, our size, uh, whatever it is, we can always do our absolute best every day. And if, and if that's something that our coach values and that we start to value in each other and ourselves, that becomes part of our team culture. And we are, we are already a, a good ways towards doing what Carol Dweck has, has researched as being something that makes athletes perform at the absolute highest levels. Um, so that's a great segue into principle number two, the elm tree of mastery. And uh, as, you, as you look at the, the word elm tree, you'll notice that it's three letters. And we've been talking about effort, so that is not a coincidence. We've, we've just hit the E. So Carol Dweck gave us a nice little segue there uh, into this principle um, that, that really is a, a, a key part of the Positive Coaching Alliance philosophy. So as, as we look at how we've defined success in the past, probably the most obvious overt way, you look at the scoreboard. You can go into any game at any time, and the, the simplest thing that people will point to as how's it going is the score. And the, the problem with that is that we are summarizing 60 minutes of game, 15 minutes of warm-ups, all the attention we've played, paid all week to this contest, and we're going to summarize it with two digits, mm -hmm. ours and theirs. And so as, as we do that, that scoreboard is going to give us results. That's it. Bottom line, don't tell me any stories, just how did it end up? Um, it's, and, and those results will be reported as graded on a curve. They're going to compare us to others, um, which is part of competition to be sure. However, we have absolutely no control over a good part of that. We don't have any control over how strong that other team is or how weak that other team is. The scoreboard might look like we had a dominating day and, and we may have, but if the reason for that is that their entire A team was out with the flu or playing in a tournament in another city, then we really didn't achieve anything. We were just the beneficiaries of, of circumstances that, had, that were completely out of our control. So that scoreboard with comparing us with others sort of takes the ball out of our hands uh, in a lot of ways. And finally, 
if we look at that scoreboard as the beat all end all measure of whether or not we are successful based on a mistake or a, an omission or a lapse by an individual, that mistake is not okay. It says so right on the scoreboard. The reason why it's no longer two to two with five seconds less in the game is because they put one past our goalie that went through her legs. And, and if we use a scoreboard as our summary of our success, that's the kind of conclusion a goalkeeper who may have played the best game of her life, the conclusion she will have just by looking at those numbers is it's my fault that it's three to two. And most coaches would agree that that doesn't tell the whole story. So we shift over to the mastery definition. And we're getting into this model, this elm tree. And we, again, we started with that effort. Now, first and foremost, we as a coach and the players, uh, again, to themselves first, and even as the team, to the team as a whole, we're gauging success on effort uh, as, as a first step. Uh, another key, key element, especially as we're looking at a long season or even a long practice or even a drill with multiple reps, all of those experiences involve learning. So we're putting forth an effort. We're trying to develop and improve based on whatever this experience is, whether it be a game or a rep um, or, or even one part of a game um, or even week to week in a season, that learning is a key part of that. And finally, as teachers, coaches, we know that one of the best ways to learn is by making mistakes. And that once we've made that mistake, if we're able to compartmentalize it, process it, and, and go from there and learn from it, um, that's moving us closer to mastery. We are going to be better players after that mistake. In fact, I, I see your mistakes are okay, and I would even raise, raise the ante a little bit and say mistakes are critical to our success, team. That part of our culture is we bring forth our best effort. We are trying to learn. We, we know that part of our success is being better at the end of the season than at the beginning or at the end of practice than after this game than before this game. And that mistakes are not only okay, but if we're going to maximize that learning, we're going to make mistakes, especially if we're putting forth our best effort. Imagine the power of your team feeling like they can measure success based on how hard they work, how much they learn, and what they get out of the mistakes that they will inevitably make. Fantastic. Um, so I want to pull back for a second. Let's do a little check here. Make sure that we're not getting too unicorn warm fuzzy. We talked at the beginning that, that we don't, uh, you know, sometimes this stuff sounds great and then we get into the heat of battle and that's not the way it is in the trench. Um, think back to when you learned how to ride a two-wheel bicycle. Out of curiosity, raise your hand if your parents hired a bicycle cohortly uh, for $50 an hour for 18 sessions so that you could learn how to ride that too. Okay, not, doesn't look like a lot of you did that. Um, raise your hand if you do remember the day you learned how to ride a bike, if that's actually vivid in your mind. So you may just, you do, you do. Yeah. Kelly, can you tell us anything about that day? It was my fifth birthday and I got the bike the morning and I had PM kindergarten and I rode it up and down my hilly street the whole morning and I came in with blood running down my legs and blood on my elbows, no helmets back then. And I told my mom I did not want to go to school because I didn't learn how to ride a bike yet. Now, Kelly and I, Kelly and I have never met and, and she's getting a gold star for the day. She came in with that story completely unprepared. She didn't know I was going to ask about that. Did you hear those details? Kindergarten? Mm -hmm. And she remembers the blood. She remembers the more, it was the morning kindergarten and up and down. She, think how long she stayed with that. Painful. There was no coach. There was no whistle. Um, was there a whiteboard involved? No. No Did whiteboard. Did you sit down for 15 Of course not. Kelly worked those mistakes in. The mistakes that made her knees bleed are the exact mistakes that taught her body. You can't lean quite that far when you're compensating for that tip. And she, she probably didn't consciously make those connections, but the myelin was wrapping around her nerves and, and she was used to learn. And as she felt herself learning, just like the research says, she was willing to put forth even more effort than she had before. That process of making a mistake and learning from it and feeling and more effort is going to get me there. 
it did, it ultimately did. It was quite a bit to do that. So I, I encourage you to think of that your your story uh, yourself there. Now, Kelly was in kindergarten when that happened. Let's watch a, uh, a video here uh, at a slightly higher level than kindergarten. We have a Stanley Cup winning hockey coach. And when you watch him talk for one minute, you are going to hear that if you're a member of the Boston Bruins on this Stanley Cup championship drive, you are expected to make mistakes. And he's got a real special way of putting that into the culture as something they want to do, something they will expect to do, um, but something they will minimize, move on, and raise the level of their game because of. So, nice stop that. Ooh, you left me wanting to hear more, and that's awesome. Andrew, I love it. I love your energy. I love your style. I mean, I, you would definitely keep my attention for two hours. I thought that was that was really great. You uh, you do a nice job at, like, changing your tone of voice and using a lot of expression. I think that's that's fantastic. Um, I loved a lot of the words that you said. There's uh, Some of the things, I like to write down notes, and some yeah. of them are stealing things from you, and some of them are suggestions for you, and I think I did more stealing than suggestions, um, which is good. But the one thing that I really like the way you compared scoreboard and mastery definition, it seems like a simple thing, but to get that across really simply and clearly is not easy to do. And I think you did a really nice job at just talking about, you know, the results. If you're just focusing on the results, look what you're missing. But if you're focusing on mastery, you know, think about all that that goes into that. I thought you did a really nice job at that. One thing that triggered a memory for me, and it's sort of along the same lines of what you were talking about, you said if you were focusing on just a scoreboard, Results and you look up, you know, you've got two digits that tell you everything that happened. Um, there's a, a trainer down in Tampa named Barry Mistel, and he's actually coached for the NBA. But he says one of the things he brought up, uh, he uses in his workshops, is that one of the things he would always do is after the game was over and he brought his team into the locker room and they talked, they'd bring them back out and he would reset the score to zero. And he would say, Now look at that. Now look at the score. It's zero, zero. It's nothing. It's clean slate. So I just thought that was kind of a neat visual too. If I've, I've, I've used that at some workshops because I think it's just good to say, like if you're valuing the scoreboard so much and you realize at the end of the game, the coach just has to walk over and hit reset, it's back at zero. What does that mean? Then there's absolutely no proof that you did anything that day. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I also, can you hear me? Because I think you're going to- it buffered, a little, it buffered a little bit. I'm going to turn off my iPad and see if that helps. Okay. Um, I also like the idea of being graded on a curve. I never heard that before, and that's a great that's a great analogy. When you're being compared to another team, that's that's what they're doing. So I thought that was that was really clever too. Um, I like the way that you talked about mistakes. I thought that was really great. The bike analogy was awesome. I've used biking and walking before, like with teenagers. How many of you have walked walk? How many of you walked into this room? You know, how'd you learn how to walk? How'd you learn how to do that? I thought that was really great. Um, one of the things that I've I've seen other trainers do too, in, in terms of the bike analogy is talk about um, when you're, when you were like as a parent trying to teach your child how to ride a bike, did you sit them down, you explained how to do it, you sat them on the couch and you said, okay, you gotta put your hands on the handlebars, you gotta put your feet on the pedals, and then you go out and you watch them do it, and if they're wobbling, do you scream at them? Like, what are you thinking? How can you not do this? I just taught you how <laughs> to do it. I thought that was kind of cool, too, for the parents. Like, you can't teach a kid how to ride a bike by screaming at them, even though you told them exactly what they need to do. So it's kind of a good analogy for coaches and parents to realize the things that we yell at kids for, there's no way they're going to know how to do it unless they make mistakes and they learn and they practice. So just an extension of your bike analogy. I thought that was a, a neat idea. but. I'm excited. I'm excited to see you do more. I think that was great. Great, uh, great session here for 10 minutes. So that's awesome. Next week, if you want to choose a different principle, you can, or if you want to go through this one all the way through to the end, you'll have 20 minutes. So you'll probably be able to get through more of the, the whole principle, hopefully. The, the time will be fascinating because I'm so, so guilty of exactly what you just said, of what you said back at the, uh, at, when, when you flew into Minneapolis and we're talking about how a especially the new pretenders, it's dominate. The first comment is you talk too much yeah. um, because that, that it's just me to the T when I was practicing last night, there wasn't the slide that every time I went through, I would, Oh, this would be great. Oh, this would be great. This would be great. I realized I got through three slides about the fifth or sixth time that I went through it. The first three slides, like that were just absolute 15 second intro slides. I was mulling over and messing with for like 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. And I realized this, this could go on forever. I got, it's going to be really, really hard. There's so much meat in, there, in this stuff. There is. But you have to remember too, you know, the percentage of learning, you know, people only remember 10% of what you tell them. 
I mean, that's ridiculous. In a two hour workshop, they remember 10% of what you're just telling them. And we feel like we have all this information to tell them. You know, you've got, I mean, 50% is what they see and hear. I mean, and, and 90% is what they're actually actively involved in. So yeah. like, I always remember that, especially when I'm, I was just doing a workshop on Monday night and it was, it didn't start till eight o'clock, which is rough on a Monday night at the end of a school year. So these people were like toast the minute they got there and I had them get up and I had them move and they looked at me like, ugh, <laughs> it's like the last thing I want to do right now, lady. Right, but right. once I got them up and moving and talking and I had them standing up for 15 minutes because I thought if I sit them back down again, I'm going to lose them. And so I just, I kept them up. We moved, we moved it. Okay, let's move to this corner of the room. All right, now let's find a partner over here. Then I sat them down for only like 15 minutes and then I got them up again and we switched around again just because I was, it was like the, the energy level in the room was so low and there's only 11 of them. So tough. Yeah, <laughs> you really do. You have to read it no matter how great your stories are or no matter how great you want to tell them this information is if they're not involved and they're not making it their own, you know, you're going to lose them. I really like the way that your first question though, how would you show them? that you believe they can improve? I thought that was a good question. And I was, I was purposely trying to give you answers that weren't on the slides because, <laughs> you know, it's just, if you actually just think about the question, like, what do I do? It's, um, you know, the, the things that are on the slide are obvious. Notice it, tell them. Right, right. But if you ask me as a coach, what do I do? That wouldn't be the first thing I'd think of. I'd think of like, well, I keep stats and I keep times and I make sure they're, you know, they're doing better. Do you actually tell them that you, you know, it's, it's, it's so simple and obvious that we don't do it. <laughs> I, so, I think you did well, nice. I think that's why at the, at the end, when, when those takeaways are there, and obviously we didn't get to that, but when the takeaways are there at the end of the segments um, and they refer to the page numbers where you'd actually open up the book and see, like you said, we could sit there and go through seven of them and you're not going to have them memorized anyway. But you know, if you have that, experience where you're about riding the bike and that's what you're picturing you know then at least you know that it's in there somewhere and you're making that mental note that you know in that book that I walked away with th those the bullet points are in there and, yeah. and, and the day you want them and you go back and reference you know that's when you're gonna have those specific recipe card tools at your fingertips yeah. uh, and that's when they're gonna that's when they're gonna want four out of five ideas that are sitting right there and they aren't gonna memorize those even if we spent 25 minutes on that alone. So it, it, right. it would be time well spent. And that's the other thing too, if you can get them, like when those tools come up, if you can get them to actually think about, all right, right now, take a minute, think about a, a mistake or tool that would work for your team, your players yeah. that you have this season. Might not work next season with that group, but for this season, you know, that way they can walk away, go to practice the next day and go, oh yeah, remember I talked about, it. I was going to do the flush or I was going to do brush it off. I'm going to teach it to my team. So, and, and have them think about what is an effort goal? that might not show success on the scoreboard. You know, if you actually have them kind of wrestle with it, right. uh, with it stick with them longer too. The only other tip that I would give is um, one of the things that I love about Elm Tree of Mastery is that it's supported by 25 years of research from different areas, which you know. Um, so the other thing that's cool is that it's, it's non-controversial in terms of its mm. effectiveness at improving performance. So, you know, I, I heard you say like, we're not all rainbows and unicorns and fluff, but I mean, the, the solid hard fact is that when, Sports psychologists have studied the different environments that athletes are in. The mastery environment is going to improve performance much more rapidly. It's going to perform improve performance, period. The scoreboard focus is, is actually demotivating to athletes because, as you said, it's not giving credit for all the work they did. It's just saying you had an awesome game, but you lost. Yeah. So. There's no essay. There's no essay up there on those, on those digital numbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My daughter did that the other day, my 12-year-old. She had a great game, the whole game. And she had the last shot in lacrosse with like literally three seconds left in the game and she missed. And she was so disappointed the whole ride home. Her head was down. I'm mom, I lost the game for the whole team. And she's 12. No. I'm like, Grace, my gosh, you played beautifully. She had four goals. It was like a score of eight to eight to nine. And she had half the goals. Right. And she's there like, I lost the game for the team. I can't believe I did that. And I'm sitting there like, ah, <laughs> But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm living out this stuff in my life all the time. And I'm reminded that like, gosh, this is not just general knowledge. <laughs> right. right Well, and those, those, uh, I, I remember even just looking at the, at the presentations, you, you know, it does, you know, as we said, it is so packed with information. It's almost this microscopic footnote of the, uh, you realize, you know, that's worth pointing out. And it's funny because I got bogged down in that when I was practicing. 
-hmm. And I was even wondering how in the world am I going to talk about Carol Dweck and the fact that this stuff is not just how you run a highly efficient office and and teach kids in a school district from K through 12. You know, how do I, how am I going to get through the Carol Dweck initiation yeah. in less than 10 minutes? Yeah. And, and I just, just said, we're going to watch a video from Carol Dweck. Okay, so that was good. Any questions? <laughs> and just kept, <laughs> I kept going. Because there's so much. There's there, so is. much. there is. And there was a guy, Andrew, at the, actually the other Andrew went last night. He's a, a assistant principal and he's got, you know, huge education background. He's a huge Carol Dweck fan. And he went on for about five minutes about Carol Dweck. So I was kind of giving him like, Carol Dweck is awesome. I agree with you, but you're going to have to move on a little bit, a little bit quicker. So you pick and choose and you have them come back wanting more. As I say, that's the good stuff. It's so hard to, so hard to get off of that, but it it's is. all good. <laughs> yep, it is. All right. So I'll post the, um, I'll post the new sheet for next week. It's going to have two week block of 20 minute time slots. And uh, what I like to do is have you sign up so I can get some of some of your people, like any Minnesota people or anything like that, that would like to jump on too. It's always better to do this with more than one in an audience. So I like to get a couple people on for you. All right. Sound good? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.